Hi everybody, I'm Brent Stafford and welcome to another edition of Red Watch on GFN.TV. We're here in Warsaw, Poland for the Global Forum on Nicotine, the annual conference on safer nicotine products and tobacco harm reduction celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And joining us today is Dr. Jazz Aluwalia from Brown, you're from Brown University, correct? Yes. Yeah, School of Public Health. So tell us a bit about what you do there. And my first question is, you're a doctor doctor or just a doctor? So I'm a doctor doctor sort of doctor, right? So I'm a physician. I am trained in internal medicine and uh, actually for the early part of my career, saw patients um, as a significant part of my work. So I did research and did patient care. I actually stopped seeing patients about 25 years ago, but I've kept up my medical license so I can prescribe medications. And I worked hard for that medical degree, so I'm gonna keep it licensed. In large part, I gave up the clinical work because the research work, the administrative leadership work, and the mentoring, which is a big passion of mine, and a lot of public speaking and national and international travel uh, took over. So um, I no longer see patients, but I saw tens of thousands of patients for the first early part of my career. Now, what brought you to smoking cessation? It was very interesting. Um, it's actually very interesting. When I was an internal medicine resident, or some countries call them house job, doing my internal medicine residency, we had to do a talk. And many people gave talks on like, you know, nephritis, the kidney, cardiovascular disease. And I gave it on sort of the soft science of smoking cessation, interestingly enough. And so got sort of my appetite. But the other thing I forgot to mention is when I was a medical student at Tulane, you will not believe who my guest was. As a med student, I had the audacity to invite the then Surgeon General of the United States, the most famous Surgeon General we ever had in the US, which was C. Everett Koop. And Dr. Koop accepted my invite and I was this young punk medical student, like 20 years, 22 years old, and I went to dinner with him. And I have a picture in my office of him, me, and Jim Banta, the dean of the School of Public Health, signed by C. Everett Koop, and dated from that time point of 1986, I think. And on it, he wrote two jazz um, for your part in the tobacco wars, which I had done absolutely nothing at that point. I was a medical student. I was like 21 years old or something. But it was sort of um, very serendipitous, wasn't it? That he sort of predicted my whole life and career. And then what happened was, at a, as a fellow at Harvard, I had to do a project for my second master's degree, a clinical trial actually, it was a taking clinical trials class. So I designed a clinical trial for smoking cessation in African-American smokers using the nicotine patch in 1991 when the patch had just come on the market. I got an A, which at that point I didn't care about grades because I was now done was a doctor, so to speak. And that project for my class became my first clinical trial. And I was based in Atlanta, Georgia, at Grady Hospital, which is a very large thousand bed urban hospital with one million outpatient visits a year. And I directed the walk-in clinic, like a mini ER, um, and with about 50,000 outpatient visits a year. And my clinical research work started and was informed by my clinical work. Literally, I would have to say that over 50% of the patients were in the hospital for one of three reasons. You know, nutrition, diet, physical activity, alcohol, substance use, or tobacco. And I just thought rather than trying to treat these diseases, which physicians are very good at, I was gonna work on preventing them, ideally, if possible. Now, your research focuses on African Americans in, in a certain manner, correct? Yes. Why? I think it was informed clinically. You know, we we're informed by sort of serendipity, chance, and so on and so forth. So from 1992 to 97, my first sort of uh, faculty job at Emory University was based in downtown Atlanta with a, pop a hospital that saw predominantly African-American and lower income African-American populations. So that's what I gravitate to, I think, is point one. I think point two is, is very interesting as I was, uh, you know, just the family values that I was raised with. Um, um, was that to sort of do service, that to, to care for more vulnerable populations, which clearly African Americans in the United States have gone through a horrendous history with slavery, civil rights, and even to this day, as we know, with things like Eric Garner and the murder of innocent black um, citizens. So I think that informed me. And then I think my family values were informed by my religion. So Sikhism is an interesting religion in the sense that there's a lot of focus on egalitarianism, on something called seva, which means giving service to mankind, womankind. 
and I think that informed sort of my work as well. So, you know, um, and I guess I'm a little bit of an underdog. I like working with populations and situations that are sort of, if you will, harder. You know, in this case, you know, they don't have as much resources to follow up on clinical trials and so on and so forth. So a lot of people don't want to work with these challenging populations because it's harder, uh, while people like me enjoy working. Right, right. And for the African American communities, there's a lot of research saying that there's quite a bit of disparity there when it comes to the smoking issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Profound disparities, actually, yeah. So you mentioned research. I mean, you've been at it now for 28 years, I think, continuously funded by the NIH. Yeah, yeah. And actually been working in it for 31, but then the, the funding by NIH started, you know, three years into my early uh, career. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been good. We, you know, the trick in life is to surround yourself with people smarter than you, and then you do well. Uh, so I think I do that pretty well. <laughs> so I have to ask you then, you know, Brown, Harvard, you know, NIH funding, do you believe that vaping is something that is a good tool to be used or not? Well, it's, you know, interesting. I sometimes am a late adopter of things like, you know, I used to have a paper calendar and my wife had a, like, you know, was using her phone. And one day I left it on my flight. I travel a lot on Delta Airlines and I panicked because it was my whole life on the calendar. And I called the airport and they found it. And I went, when I went back, it was in DC, they found it. I was like, oh my God. So I switched to a calendar. And now, of course, I live on my iPhone. It's my thing for travel. I travel a lot. So I was a late adopter when, sort of e-cigarettes came out, I was like a little bit of, oh, that's just a phase, it'll go away. And I noticed that my parent organization for research, Society of Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, a lot of people were doing research on e-cigarettes. And I just sort of kept ignoring it and doing my, our research, whatever we normally do. And then sort of serendipitously working with a couple of colleagues and actually a former graduate student of mine, um, we funded our own work, doing some pilot work with uh, Juul, with e-cigarettes, the fourth generation pod based, and we had some good data, and we flipped that into an NIH-funded clinical trial, and it was odd because I was late to the game, sort of a non-believer, if you will, and I, 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 I don't let emotion inform my science. Um, I always say, I often in my talks, that science should f inform policy, not emotion. And there's tons of emotion, as you know, in the United States, in India, in Canada, UK, on this topic. And I'm not a big fan of emotion and drama and sort of, um, you know, extremes one way or the other, sort of the different sides, if you will. Um, so the, we published the first clinical trial done in the world using a fourth generation e-cigarette product. Others had published on earlier first, second, third generation tank-based models. Peter Hayek has done some elegant work out of the UK in New England Journal of Medicine and other places and he's a phenomenal researcher. But we published ours and the findings were very, they were just, to me, jolting. And I began to believe that actually e-cigarettes were probably the biggest game changer, besides some policy changes like indoor or air smoking bans and things like indoor, indoor smoking bans and things like that, was the biggest game changer I'd seen in 30 years. And so I was very excited about it. And then of course, look where we are now. It's, it's a horrible situation almost in any country. You got India banning all products. And not only that, banning research. Like I would love, we do some research in India, clinical trials and otherwise, and I would love to do research, for example, studying nicotine pouch in smokeless tobacco users. So India is the country, one of the only countries in the world where lung cancer is not the leading cause of cancer in that country. Right, and lung cancer, of course, is caused by cigarettes. It's actually or head and neck cancer in India because they use smokeless tobacco. Oh, because they use that very damaging. Uh, it's called gutka. Gutka. It yeah. is one of the most nasty. It's like nuclear waste. Right. Uh, it is deadly, and I find it odd. I mean, they've sort of banned gutka, but it's very easy to get. And I just find it odd that you can get gutta, but you can't get. Um, nicotine pouches. So they've banned research in Even research, you cannot study it. The federal government will not let you do a clinical trial to study these products in India. I heard that just recently they've also brought in some legislation that bans positive coverage in the media? They arrested someone for using an e-cigarette in India. So now you would think that there are other things to do in India, like 
not arrest people like that, worry about crime, worry about white collar crime, blue collar crime, worry about how to create better crops, uh, how to become more of a democracy, than to sort of arrest someone for using an e-cigarette. I just find it sort of ironic. I find it actually almost uh, third degree manslaughter that you allow the sale of cigarettes. Uh, the Indian government actually has a stake in ITC, as you may know, and, um, and it gets a revenue stream from that, right? in terms of taxes and revenue stream otherwise because they're part owners and it's just sort of horrible actually you know it's just absolutely horrible in my opinion in terms of covering this issue the stuff that's happening in in, in downstream countries is symptomatic as opposed to you know originating obviously from there it's coming from the debate in the u.s and uh, i would say yeah no i think that's True, although it's interesting they become much more radical about it, obviously. Like, I mean, the United States doesn't ban it. Um, the Uni you know, I can get funding from the NIH. I can get funding from different organizations to study it. So at least the United States is willing to study it. They don't listen to the research findings necessarily, but, uh, but we can study it. Um, you know, my theory about this whole topic globally um, is that, um, is that, Everyone practices harm reduction. We all do. You probably did yesterday at dinner. I know I did. Is that when there was dessert, I decided to only eat part of my dessert, right? And um, when I cross the streets, I uh, looked both ways. I don't use my phone while I'm walking on the street. That's harm reduction, actually. Seat belts, you know, it's endless, right? What we know uh, uh, and, and what risks. I speed on the highway, unfortunately. I like driving fast. I drive very carefully. I don't drink alcohol. And so I know that at least alcohol is not going to impact my driving. So that's all harm reduction. And so when people say, oh, I don't believe in harm reduction, it's not that they're lying. Is that they're focusing, because the topic, let's say, is on tobacco harm reduction. They're talking about tobacco harm reduction. And the reason people don't accept it, this is my theory, no one's given me a better one, is there is such deep mistrust and hatred of the tobacco industry. So it's all about the industry. So the feeling is that, quote, big tobacco, here they go again. So they've made cigarettes, they addicted people, they killed people, and, now, and they're still killing people. And now what they want to do is they want to switch to another product that doesn't kill people. I mean, I don't, it doesn't kill people. It's not safe, but it's safer. But they want to keep a generations and generations addicted forever and make money. Well, there's some truth to that, actually. Yeah, they want to keep addicted and they want to make money. I mean, corporations are, are there to make money. They're accountable to shareholders. And so as long as products are legal, that's what companies do. If we don't like something, then figure out how to make it illegal or ban it or whatever the case is, regulate it, tax it, or do whatever you want. So, so the problem with tobacco harm reduction is people are not focused on the individual or the smoker. They're focused on the corporation. Right? And that bothers me as a physician for physicians because they should far worry about the smoker, not worry about a corporation that may want to make money that could actually benefit the smoker, right? As a physician and a researcher in this area, what can you say in terms of, one, the efficacy of using e-cigarettes to quit smoking? Are they efficacious? There is no question now that based on Peter's work, Hayek in the UK, our work, and many other people's work, and the Cochrane Review, which comes out of the United Kingdom, which is very trusted, very unbiased. And even to some extent, the Institute of Medicine's NASM report, the National Academy of Sciences Engineering Medicine, which is now outdated. That's 2018. Yeah, oh, very good, yeah, it's, it's, it's old. I mean, so if it was updated, it would even be more emphatic. It helps people quit smoking. There's not even a question about that, even though many people like to say, oh, well, it's still a question, it's still a question. It's, it's not a question from a scientific standpoint. Um, and there's even now decent evidence that it works better than at least other NRT products. Surely Patch, Peter showed it doubled the quit rate. That was published in the England Journal of Medicine. Uh, whether it works better against Varenicline or Bupropion, Zyban, I don't know that there are clinical trials out there but if you sort of look at the data, it appears to be at least at par with that, uh, those numbers, or possibly even a little bit higher. So there's a, one thing is quitting smoking. The other one is moving to safer nicotine. Right. And as a 25-year smoker, I moved to safer nicotine, and I got no reason to quit uh, doing that. Now, is that 
okay from a health point of view or is there only one way to go and that's uh, you, to get off of nicotine and unless you do that you're kind of infringing on this sensibility right. um, that causes part of the you know the hyperventilation yeah no i think that um sort of the bigger question is um and neil benowitz gives a nice talk on it's a new talk as he he tells me and he gave it to for us at brown university when he visited about a year and a half ago which is that, is there a role for nicotine, um, recreational nicotine in society, right? That's sort of the million dollar question. And I think the CDC and the FDA and the federal government of the United States seems to send a message, you know, not Im explicitly, but pretty implicitly, the answer is no. And that's not gonna work. Because then we're talking about is banning nicotine and we know what happened with prohibition with alcohol. So that's like a ridiculous path to go down because that's gonna be a setup for no regulation E Valley all over again, and E Valley and Valley when you have things that are not regulated. Um, so I think I, my personal opinion is I think there is a role. Uh, it's not, I don't use nicotine, and I have no desire to. I don't want my kids to. Uh, I don't want my friends to. But if people want to, I think it's a, it's a choice. I think it's a reasonable choice. It turns out that I think nicotine inhaled, especially by pouches, is safer than many other choices of substances used. Uh, you know, from opioids, clearly fentanyl, injecting heroin, um, sniffing glue. Um, Cannabis, I think. I it's... was coming to that too. Using in a vape 20 times a day is dramatically safer than three alcohol drinks a day. Dramatically safer, actually. Um, so I would say in general, almost safer than alcohol. And I would say that the science is still debatable, so I don't want to be too tight on this. But I would say we're gonna be a little bit surprised about cannabis and how not so safe it is. I just find it very interesting in the United States how we, you know, things happen fast sometimes. Sometimes it's good, like gay marriage got approved by the Supreme Court much faster than people thought. It was like, it just, it was surprising. I was very pleased by it. So sometimes there's these tipping points and you know, unrelated of course, but in this case, uh, cannabis went from decriminalization, which I fully support, to out of the blue, legalization took its own sort of uh, course and rapidly moved. I think it might be about seven to 10 states, it's I think, decriminalized, sorry, legalized, legalized in the United States, which legalized means then you can use it for recreation, not just for medicinal, but recreational. And by the way, let me be very clear about medicinal use of uh, cannabis or THC. There are literally only three things it, quote, works for. Glaucoma, um, cachexia from cancer treatment. In other words, it's... Your nausea. And it, well, yeah, nausea and stimulates appetite. You know, Kumar goes to White Castle. I don't know if you ever saw yes. the movie. You know, they get the munchies because they're high. And then there might be sort of one other category. So when people say I need it for medicinal reasons, they better have one of those reasons. It's pretty limited. Right. Yeah. So, so it's about recreational. It's, it's interesting, my wife's a pediatrician and you know, we confidentially share stories about her day at work because she actively still sees patients. In fact, she, that's the only thing she does. And she tells me it is now very common for her, she's a hospitalist, that 15 year olds will come in with severe stomach aches, some vomiting and things like that. And you would think, oh, they have a GI bug, a virus. You know what's one of the first things they do? They do a tox screen. They're looking for marijuana. Right. And they will not have uh, uh, an infectious disease cause of their stomach ache. It's just uh, cannabis toxicity. This is not a benign drug, you mm. know. And so it's very interesting that the acceptance and support from even congressional legislation and the courts and FDA maybe, and so on and so forth for cannabis, but not reason. So my whole theory is the hatred of the tobacco industry, that it's just linked to the tobacco industry. Yeah. Well, I'll throw this out for you too as well, Ben, about that. Um, the, I think the hatred for the tobacco industry goes back to the founding of the country. If it wasn't for tobacco, the United States may never have actually happened oh, right. because it was the very first, it was the crop that really took for them. And then of course the first slaves were not for cotton, right. it was for tobacco. Right. So there's, there is a really a deep, uh, you know, vein there. And Duke University wouldn't exist. It was founded by, you know, it was a Bonsack machine that revolutionized the mechanization of rolling cigarettes. And then you could make 50,000 cigarettes 
you know, in a day. And now, of course, you can make 50,000 cigarettes every minute with one machine. Yeah, you think there has to be something deep like this going on, more than just the tobacco industry lying in the last 50 or 60 years of the 20th century. There's some stuff that's going back a lot farther. So let me ask you this then. I mean, the science seems to be bastardized, to use a very tough word there. But I mean, literally, you know, scientists who completely, totally reject the science that's coming out that supports tobacco harm reduction products. How do you explain that? And do you ever bump up against that within your scientific community? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> in the United States, um, unlike the UK, um, every major medical organization is opposed to using vapes for quitting or, or the role of vaping or e-cigarettes or anything. So the American Lung Association, the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, so our voluntary organizations that do advocacy and fund research are vehemently opposed. Second, every major medical organization, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Medical Association, American Thoracic Society, which is, you know, pulmonary system and so on and so opposed. And I just feel very sad by that, you know, um, these are my colleagues, these are very reputable organizations, and I just wish they would follow the science rather than following the rhetoric or following the emotions or whatever the case, uh, you know, the case may be. Um, E-cigarettes don't cause cancer, so you would think the American Cancer Society would be sort of support it. E-cigarettes are probably not perfectly safe for your lungs because putting something into your lungs whatever it might be, is probably not the best thing to do. So you could say the American Thoracic Society could be, be, be cautionary about it. But even, for example, nicotine pouches, that product, should it be routed through rather than Center for Tobacco Products, which it is, I tell the tobacco industry colleagues, I told them today, yesterday rather, and I said, you guys should, I wish you would take this through CEDAR, the Center for the Evaluation of Drugs uh, at FDA, which is the medicinal route. Nicotine pouches would be approved as a medicinal product. It's, as, it's, it's nothing more than nicotine gum in a different form. Gum, you chew, chew, chew. I guess you spit out the gum, yeah. And here the pouch, you let it sit there, and then you take it out. It's a very safe product. I mean, nicotine is not safe in pregnancy. We say, everyone says, I just read something this morning, it's not safe, in, as you've heard, in the developing brain of the adolescent and the frontal lobe and the brain develops up to age 25. So we hear that. But when you try to probe deeper into the science and you listen to experts such as Neil Benowitz and others talk about the science behind the it's not safe for the developing brain, it's probably not good for the brain. But in terms of what exactly, uh, the science is mild. It's not the way we dramatize how dangerous it is. Again, cannabis for the developing brain and the youth, nic nicotine, not cigarettes, nicotine for the developing brain, I'll let others decide. But it's not, you know, nicotine is deadly for the adolescent brain and cannabis is benign and safe. There is, there is no moral hysteria uh, amongst the suburban housewife class when it comes to kids using cannabis to the same extent. Yeah, I mean, it may turn a little bit of a bland eye, but I agree with you, there's, and they, the housewives or whoever I should, you know, homemakers. Homemakers. Yeah, you know, whoever they are, and, and house husbands and homemakers, that they themselves may be using cannabis, and probably are. Sure, so, so if I hear you correctly, Nicotine does not give somebody brain damage. The, that statement, I would have to say that is correct. <laughs> the way you worded it, yes. Yeah, brain we've yeah. seen brain damage like in public health yeah, advertising. I know, I that know. language is used no, by, know. you know, California. Yeah, I know. No, no, it, it, that is, I'm not a big fan of misinformation on anyone's side. So, you know, the problem with the tobacco industry is, you know, they lied extensively for decades. They hid knowledge. They lied. They controlled Congress and Senate in the decades of the 40s, 50s, 60s. We gave rations to U.S. military and they went to war with it. We addicted generations. And they knew it caused cancer. And the, my favorite is the image of the seven dwarfs, the seven CEOs before Congress in 92, I think saying uh, nicotine is not addictive. I too agree nicotine is not addictive. They committed perjury and there were no consequences. It was incredible. 
I mean, I just, that's just absolutely incredible to me. They committed murder. And then what happened is they accepted nicotine's addictive. They accepted it was, it killed people. They accepted it caused lung cancer. Now one could be cynical about it, and one would be accurate, that they chose that route to protect themselves legally. And mm -hmm. it did protect them legally. And so the lawsuits were whittling away, because at this point, anyone who smokes and gets cancer, it was very much a choice. Where we are with the industry now is that um, they, it's very hard for them to lie. They're watched with a, a fine tooth comb and uh, with a magnifying glass in the United States, I would say. I'll speak for the US. Um, um, they behave, they're very cautious, and their science, which is an interesting topic. Right now there's a science, there's a talk going on down the hall on the politics of publishing related to the industry. Uh, Sarah Cooney is hosting that right now at GFN is that um, their science is good. And um, they, their clinical trials and their studies are reviewed by journals, by the FDA, with a finer tooth comb than my work is. I could probably get away with misrepresenting science easier than the tobacco industry. I think with, with a very cautionary eye, we should look at the science and take it somewhat seriously and maybe try to replicate it and stuff, but we should uh, take it seriously. For example, my organization, SRT, banned tobacco industry people from attending the conference two years ago. I'm opposed to that because I think we should hear all voices. And if the science is good, you should be able to see it right. on the page, right? Have you experienced any ostr ostracization? I'm waiting for that to happen. Um, it hasn't happened yet. And, um, you know, I think I don't take money from the industry, tobacco industry. Uh, I should let the audience know, and you know that I do have a conflict of interest. I am working with a startup company called Cunovia. Have you heard of it? No. Oh, this is very interesting. So we'll see how this goes. So Cunovia was founded by uh, uh, a young startup kind of entrepreneur named Mario Donick. And um, he wanted to deliver nicotine through a pulmonary um, uh, vehicle. And Brian Quigley came on, he was a former uh, CEO of US uh, Smokeless Tobacco at Altria. He's an Altria guy, but was very experienced running you know, a corporation, a multi-billion dollar corporation. And the team was only four people. And I had heard about them that they were developing a device that they were gonna take through the FDA through Cedar, a medicinal route. It's not a vape, it's a device that doesn't use a battery. So vapes use, ba use batteries. And there's some concern when you use a battery. So the reason cigarettes are dangerous is because you light it and there's thermal de degradation products, combustion. And then IQOS is safer because you don't combust the tobacco leaf. And then e-cigarettes are, in my opinion, safer than IQOS because there's no tobacco leaf, right? And then nicotine pouch is even safer than e-cigarettes because there's no battery. Are you with me? Yeah, I don't understand the, the battery part. Oh, battery? Why that? It heats. Wow. And so it doesn't heat like lighting a cigarette to 900 degrees, but it heats and has a metal coil and there's some leaching of sort of the metals, very small amount, it's a very small amount. And you could get some heating with some thermal degradation products. So, but you know, it's all relative life, right? I mean, a cheesecake is not healthy, right? So I'm not trying to compare cheesecake to cigarette. I'm just pointing out that it's all relative. But, but this is a device that uses a vibrating mesh there's no battery. I'm not an engineer, but it's absolutely fascinating. And the trick is it vibrates very fast and it aerosolizes, right? It creates an aerosol of droplets that are less than five microns, so that's invisible to the eye. And you need that level, that small level, like an e-cigarette, to then get into the alveoli, all the way down the lungs. It can't go into your mouth and get stuck in your mouth. Then you really have nicotine spray in your mouth. Right, right or it can't get stuck in your airways, your, uh, your main trachea, and it can't get stuck in your bronchi. It's gotta really go full, all the way down where the capillary bed takes on the nicotine and delivers it to the brain to bind to the receptor to help you quit smoking or give you the satisfaction. So we are working with the FDA. The FDA is thrilled about this because they want to have products that go through the medicinal route. And um, we're gonna enter phase one trials uh, within the next uh, 12 months. It's venture, venture backed uh, with uh, investors. 
And I have, I am um, an equity owner and also chair of the scientific advisory board. So that's my conflict of interest. Uh, and I don't think this means that we should only have medicinal nicotine or even a medicinal pulmonary device. I think there's still a role for vapes because vapes would be sold through the non-medicinal route for people, I guess, who want to use it recreationally or want to use it to quit smoking. You don't need a prescription. We're going the prescription route. Mm. Yeah. So how is any, any of that different than, say, how e-cigarettes developed originally 20 years ago. You know, an inventor saw a problem, created some technology. That technology hit, you know, the west coast of the United States. A bunch of free-thinking people in California went, oh, wow, this is working. It kind of spread on the early internet. And then they all, you know, kicked in and created juice. Big tobacco was nowhere near this e-cigarette development for the first you know, 15 years almost, you know, or 10 years at least. Big Tobacco didn't create e-cigarettes. No, no. It, no. As we know it yeah. here, they got into the market by buying in, by buying in and, and so forth, and then they've really jumped in yeah. now. And, and I can tell you that most vapors hate Big Tobacco as much as the public health people do. Yeah, and I think it could be that um, you know, whether I'm being cynical, I mean, I'm not an expert, I have no clue, but it could be that the tobacco industry want to preserve their market of uh, combustible tobaccos and they weren't going to get into this. You know, for back, way back when, 50s, 60s, there were hidden tobacco industry documents that talked about the industry was trying to make safer cigarettes. Yeah, the Brown and Williamson documents. Yeah, and people, you know, the public, public health community, surgeon generals, wanted the industry to create a safer cigarette, a safer cigarette. And then when, quote, a safer cigarette was created, the e-cigarette, um, we're not satisfied with that. So we don't want anything. So now it's prohibition kind of attitude. And I think it, sort of the tobacco, large tobacco industries have embraced this because they can transition from one form of revenue to the other. They're accountable to shareholders. Right. And yeah. isn't it a good thing, though, that as oh, long I think as the it products is. stay legal? Uh, I think that what say? As long as selling cigarettes is still legal, yeah. which the governments re are responsible for that. Currently, it remains legal in the United States in the foreseeable future. It appears that it will always be legal in the U.S., where they will regulate it and make it tighter are things like banning menthol, possibly, right? Sure. And then second is this nicotine product standard. But isn't that ridiculous? They get, public health goes nuts over, you know, how big tobacco lied about, you know, filters and putting filters on a cigarette. And then what happens, they, you know, people inhale much deeper to try to get that nicotine. And then now public health is going, here, we're going to sell you a cigarette with no nicotine in it. And somehow that's smart. I don't get it. The science of very low nicotine cigarettes, you know, manufactured by 22nd century cigarettes, and the science done by my dear friends and colleagues, Dorothy Atsukami, Eric Doni, and others that have been published in the journal of medicine, I don't fully understand because, um, and I'm not sure the science, the scientific community fully does either, because if you take cigarettes down to very low nicotine levels or with no nicotine, but I think you can't, you can't force, the United States government and the courts cannot force to no nicotine. That's, as you know, that's de facto banning, which would be in violation, I think. I'm not, again, a lawyer. But that's right, yeah. Right, so it has to go to a very low level, which the industry will file suit and say that is de facto down to zero nicotine, and they might win in the courts. So, but then, so maybe you don't go take it all the way to very low, you go to four, I forgot the units, four milligrams or micrograms or whatever. You take it down to four instead of two. But I agree with you to some extent, if nicotine is the addictive substance and you're anti-vape, then people want their nicotine. Aren't they gonna use either more of the cigarette or draw it deeper? And if they're drawing it deeper, this is a combustible tobacco leaf. So I, I, I will, I'm going to accept, I don't know everything, so I'm a little ignorant on this topic and I feel like I need to learn more. But I think that's a good thing is that we should, back to my original comment, how we started, is that science should be informing policy. We should really understand things before they're rolled out as policy or law. Isn't there some room somewhere for redemption? Is the idea here that the tobacco companies are not allowed to redeem themselves? It's a very interesting question. I actually asked my students at Brown University in my tobacco class about that. And um, I don't know where the discussion went and a student 
sort of got back to me and said that they felt like redemption wasn't the right word. And I actually agreed with them. I don't remember what the right word would be. But I think what the, the concept, what you're saying, redemption, I, I know what you're saying. And I think that is a very good question that we should all look. We, the United States, for example, for people who've been incarcerated, when you apply to college in generally the United States, there's a box that says, have you been incarcerated before? I don't know if it's on the universal application or in the supplementary applications, that's how it works in the US for colleges. There's a big movement at the elite colleges like Brown and Harvard and so on and so forth. That box has been removed, the idea of redemption. In other words, you've paid your dues, you went to prison, and you're out now. I think that all religions, Christ and Christianity, Sikhism, Islam, Judaism, etc., feels that um, we all can be redeemed. We all make errors. We're all human. And um, if you can learn from them and grow from them. And likewise, one would think the industry can. This is my opinion. Um, I think they should be still watch very caution, cautionary. Because anything that is a for-profit company, which I support, uh, for-profit companies, I support for-profit generally, um, uh, should be watched with caution because there's a profit motive. And the government should be watched with caution too because governments profit greatly from tobacco, either through tobacco taxes, you know, or India as investment in ITC, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one should watch all things with a cautionary eye. And I think, but on the other hand, Corporations also are the biggest innovators. They create innovation. Like, for example, you know, people don't trust Exxon, Sunoco, Ar 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 Aramco, Aramco, the, the gas station oil producers. But they're the ones who also are going to very quickly start innovating into solar and wind and things like that. And people, you know, the worst industry is the tobacco industry for people, right? In general, at least in the US. Next down is probably the uh, nuclear industry, uh, the war machine, the defense manufacturers, you know, Northrop Grumman and all those people. And right up there is also the uh, oil industry, very high up. And ironically, you know, they may profit, they toxify the environment and so on and so forth, but they will also be the innovators that are gonna help come up with the solution. It's not gonna be me, you know, it's gonna be the innovators and the money that backs it, that does that. So, it's a long-winded answer to, you know, I think we, we have to watch things carefully, but we should support innovation and we should just support harm reduction. By the way, gas is harm. I drive, a, I drive a combustible car and many people don't understand this. When you buy a fully electric car, it's made with a lithium. And it turns out that the carbon emissions, I'm not an expert on this, to create, I read this in Consumer Reports, that you have to keep your electric car for five to seven years for it to have been net neutral on carbon emissions compared to combustible. And that electric car has to be your primary car. Coming up later this year, the WHO's SETC conference, COP10 is about to happen, uh, the Conference of the Parties. If you had an opportunity to get a message to the delegates, what would that message be? So I don't follow the WHO and the COP and the acronyms. You know, there's only so much I can do. So I plead a little bit of ignorance. I would just say what I've seen of the WHO and some of the pronouncements and things, um, they're not using science to inform policy. So I'll just leave it at that. I say with the message is focus on the smoker, focus on the human being, have empathy, don't judge. If someone's gonna make money in getting someone less unhealthy, double negative, you know, cigarettes, less unhealthy, then support that. We don't want people using cigarettes. I prefer and I support people not starting to use nicotine. I don't want my kids or kids vaping or using pouches or anything, but if they do, they do. I mean, I don't want kids smoking pot, using opioids, fentanyl. There are a lot of things I don't want, um, but they happen. Um, so I think is that, you know, be balanced. The world is gray. Let's stop the black and white stuff. And lastly, here at GFN, why is an event like this important? Well, this is my first time at GFN, um, so it's a little bit of an eye-opener for me. It's very different. There are very few academics there, 
And obviously this is not a scientific conference per se, like Society of Research on Nicotine, with sort of clinical trials and abstracts and poster sessions. So it was important for me because I get, to, I, I like get to see different stakeholders. There are a lot of stakeholders in this game, so to speak. It's not just sort of scientists or policymakers. They're consumers, they're advocates, they're manufacturers, they're suppliers. There's a lot of things. You can't just sort of shut down anything just because you want to. There are economic and other ramifications. Um, so I think, you know, like the whole COVID thing, when we shut down schools and shut down businesses, it was a disaster for low-income people.